Let's get this. We are coming to you live from the capital city of the great state of Austin, and we are the Eyes on Texas Multicast. Welcome to the weekly broadcast, the bi-weekly broadcast now, that understands that the pride and the tradition of the Texas football program must never be entrusted to the timid or the weak. That's why we come strong on the Eyes on Texas Multicast. We are a product of the Republic of Football on the Dave Campbell's football, Texas Football Podcast Network. We are powered by our presenting partner at Grande Equipment. I'm Aaron Hogan, morning show host here at The Horn in Austin. He is the senior writer at Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, the great Mike Craven. Hello, Mike. How are you? It's game week and a fairly big one coming up on uh, on Saturday. I'm excited. Week two is a, a big one. We got Texas, Alabama, A&M, Miami, Texas Tech, Oregon, UTSA, Texas State. So a, a loaded slate in week two. Safe to say. And uh, we are the multicast that keeps you on top of all things Texas football. And as Mike just said, as a senior writer at Dave Campbell's Texas Football, all things Texas football, everything around the state. Uh, but obviously our eyes are firmly on the burnt orange and the longhorns. We call it a multicast because it's available to watch weekly on the Dave Campbell's Texas Football YouTube channel. Also on the Horn in Austin, uh, Austin's YouTube channel. That's at uh, Horn Austin on YouTube, the Horn Austin. It's also available for download on iTunes and Spotify. And as I said, Mike, we go bi-weekly now. We record an episode on Monday that comes out on Tuesdays. And now for game week to preview the following game, because mostly our Monday recording is a review of what went on. In that week's game, uh, we're going to drop another one that will preview the game itself. And obviously, this is a, a massive, massive game for the Texas Longhorns. Um, you know, since 2008, Alabama uh, is 63 and six at home. Uh, they don't lose home games. And to win on the road at Alabama, you need uh, one of two things, Rod. The history would tell you, right? You go to the record books, the teams who have beaten Nick Saban's teams on that field at Bryant State, St- Bryant Denny Stadium have one of two things. They either have an elite defense, elite level defense like LSU did in 2011 when they beat them nine to six. Alabama then turned around and and beat uh, LSU in that national championship game. But I still think that should have been Oklahoma State playing for the Natty that year. But, you know, that was my opinion. Mike Gundy might agree. Uh, But, you know, or you have to have transcendent quarterback play, Mike. I mean, you've got to have Johnny Manziel play his rear off. You've got to have Joe Burrow torch him. Uh, Even a guy like Chad Kelly at Ole Miss played one of his best games ever against Alabama when Ole Miss was able to go in there and pull the upset. It doesn't happen often. Uh, 20 games in a row they've won on that field at Bryant-Denny Stadium. Uh, what What's more likely for you Saturday at 6 o'clock, that Texas gets elite defensive uh, an elite defensive performance or that they get uh, high-level, super high-level quarterback play? Didn't think I'd ever say this for a Sark team, especially with one with a five-star quarterback, but I think it's the defense. Uh, I think we can count on – the Texas defense in a way that we can't, can't count on the offense. Uh, what Alabama likes to do offensively, I think, works into the hands of what Texas does well defensively. We saw that you know, last year where outside of one really big run by Jace McClellan and a couple scrambles by Bryce Young, the Texas defense was, was pre- able to shut down a, a good running team. Uh, there's not great wide receivers at Alabama. It's not one of those years where they have a Julio Jones and guys like that. I know Devontae Smith there. And so I think the Texas defense is going to be the key to this game and the way that Texas is able to stay in this thing. I think Quinn can have a big game. He can have a great game, but that's going to be up to Sark maximizing what he does well and eliminating some of the things he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, And he knows, you know, Steve Sarkeesian familiar with Nick Saban and vice versa. So can you craft a game plan that, as you said, highlights what, what Quinn does very well and but also you know that's that quick passing game uh, Mike that's getting the ball out of the guy's hands quick don't make him think too much uh you're gonna have to take some deep shots too though I know Texas fans are tired about the deep ball conversation after the 0 for 6 performance last week but as Sark said on Monday and we played those highlights if you go back and watch our uh, our Monday mo- Monday cast you know it wasn't just Sark Quinn I mean he had a bad throw or two in there but it was he got hit in the face a couple times uh pressure got to him ahead of the throw uh, so, you know, there was some good coverage on a couple of those for Rice. Uh, so, yes, Longhorn fans know the stat, uh, but at the same time, so does Nick Saban. Uh, and so does that Alabama defense. They're going to be flooding the the, the, the the slant routes and the crossing routes. They're going to try to keep Texas in front of them. And, and they may give up some big plays uh, or allow the big plays. See if Texas can hit them, right? I mean, if you're you're a basketball guy, Mike, if you're if the guy's not a good shooter, let him keep shooting it. Yeah. I mean, shoot himself out of the game. Uh, but I got to feel like Sark in his core believes if, if, if the, he does that, with Isaiah Nayor or A.D. Mitchell or Xavier Worthy or J.T. Sanders, they're going to hit some big ones. I mean, they're going to hit a big one or two, and that's all it takes to loosen up that defense. And a big play doesn't have to be 50 yards down the field. It can be a, a 10-yard seam route to J.T. that he then takes down the field. And, and you're right, even if those big passing plays, those vertical passing plays don't hit, 
they put something in the mind of the safeties and of the corners and of the defensive coordinator uh, that Sark wants, right? He wants those guys to get back a little bit and that allows Xavier Worthy to work the middle and and the intermediate routes. It allows JT Sanders to do the same, Jordan Winnington. Maybe it'll allow that running game to to come into the fold. And so uh, I think he has to keep calling those deep shots. He just has to be smart uh, with when he does it. Yeah. Uh, And so that's the offense. We'll talk about the offense against this Alabama defense first, and then we'll get into the Texas defense. Because I agree with your assessment that one of the two has to happen to win that game. You have to have an elite defensive performance or a transcendent offensive performance. I do think you can win it with a a, a really good defensive performance and pretty good quarterback play, right? I think that can happen because uh, we've talked to some insiders at Alabama this week on the morning show here on the Horn. Had a guy on this morning named Travis Ryer. Uh, with on three sports who's covered that program for 20 years and they have a lot of uncertainty too at Alabama you know they're not used to going you know 11 and 2 like they did last year covering that team and you know Jalen Milrow much like Quinn yours is an unproven product to quarterback uh, so we'll talk about that Alabama offense but on the defensive side you know the, the things to watch uh, are going to be you know they don't have a Quinn and Williams up front Mike they don't have uh, a Dur- Duron Payne one of those huge war daddies in the paint or in the in the, in the line of scrimmage they got, they got some guys there, but at the same time, they've got great linebackers. We know Dallas Turner is the guy on the edge that you know hurt Quinn Ewers last year. He's tremendous. Uh, you know, They do a three-down, four-linebacker set a lot of times. You mm-hmm. wonder how, how Sark's able to manipulate that a little bit uh, with his formations to get some defensive, uh, you know, optimal defensive spots for him. But their best players are Chris Braswell at their jack position and Dallas Turner. they got a kid named Jaheim Otis, who's a sophomore, number 91, Alabama, Mike who came into, came into uh, Alabama at about 385 pounds, and he's <laughs> down to about 320, 325, and he's a guy that they really like, and that's a guy to watch number 91. But they don't have that that elite war daddy, but they do have great linebackers, and their strength, if healthy, might be their secondary. Yeah, I mean, Caleb Downs, a, a freshman who led them in tackles last week against Middle Tennessee State. I mean, he's a, he's a stud, and I think w- there's a misconception about the Alabama team. They don't have a lot of known stars, but if we look at the blue-chip ratio – Alabama still has the most talented roster in the nation when it comes to the the most four and five stars on the team. It's them in Georgia. I think Alabama's blue chip ratio is something like 90%. 90% of their roster is four or five star guys. And so there's plenty of talent there. It just hasn't been proven talent. They have a couple of guys, as you mentioned, who have come along and, and have played a lot of football. But with Will Anderson gone, right, like there's not a superstar that's really stepped into that void. We're going to have to figure that out. Kool-Aid McKinstry, a uh, really good cover corner on the outside. That matchup with him and Xavier Worthy uh, is going to be interesting. I wonder if they're going to have Kool-Aid kind of shadow, shadow Xavier around the field or if he just stays on the right side of the defense like he normally does. Uh, that'll be a really interesting matchup too because to me, this game is going to come down to the Texas wide receivers winning those battles. If they can win those battles on the outside and Quinn Ewers can get them the ball, uh, obviously Texas is going to have a really good chance of, of winning this game because they have to stay balanced. It felt like last year, even with Bajon Robinson and Rashawn Johnson, there was times where Texas didn't feel like a balanced football team. Like they were going to have to throw it to win. And once that injury happened and Hudson Card was out there, it just wasn't going to work. Uh, this year, they're going to have to stay balanced, have to have that running game, put that in the linebackers, put that in the safety's minds, and then allow those wide receivers to go win, hopefully one-on-one matchups if they're able to do that. No, I agree with you 100% on that. And that's going to be a challenge. But we saw Sark last year before the Quinn Ewers injury you know, tear him up, right? His script was on point. Uh, he had Alabama on its heels. Uh, the play calls, and this is where I go to the familiarity. He knows what the structural integrity is of that Nick Saban defense. He knows what their rules are on defense. And so he knows how to design plays and formations to break those rules and to force them into confusion. Uh, he went against that defense in practice over and over again. So, um, you know, kind of like Jimbo Fisher, uh, who's an offensive mind. A lot of times when, when Nick Saban's gone against protégés, they've been defensive guys, right? They've been uh, you know, the Jeremy Pruitts or the Kirby Smarts for so long. They were defensive coaches of his. The three, the couple that have beat him are Jimbo Fisher, an offensive coach, and uh, Lane Kiffin, offensive coach at Ole Miss. And then, of course, the Joe Burrow season where it was just a magical team. Uh, but, you know, you and Sark has that knowledge of – because, because because you know, Nick Saban is so rigid on his defense, the foundations of it, how it's played, how your assignment affects everybody – can you break those, right? Can you force them to break the, the rules that Nick doesn't want to break? That's what I felt like they were doing in that opening script in the first quarter uh, last year was really, you know, attacking those weak, weak areas that he knows are there with those formations. And Quinn was so comfortable 
before the injury with what they were doing. You could tell they'd been working on it all summer. Uh, that script was was over and over repped, and it was uh, being worked to perfection. And then, of course, the the the, the injury, and he goes out and. You know, then Hudson Cards comes in, and Hudson's not 100% either. He's limping around. So then they got into survival mode. And uh, obviously, at the end of the day, Bryce Young made a play, a couple plays, and that's why he's Bryce Young. Uh, but they don't have Bryce Young this year. So can the offense do enough? And, uh, you know, that will be exciting to see if, if Sark has a script. You know he didn't do anything in the uh, in the Rice game that's going to show Nick Saban anything. Everything's going to be different than what they saw last week. Yeah, and, if, and conversely, if you're Nick Saban, you're trying to survive that script. Yeah. Right? Like, you're just trying to let Sark get through that 20, 25 pace play script, and then you settle in, and then you can play some real defense. And, like, that – one of the things to watch if you're a college football fan is to not take those first two or three drives that seriously in a football game, right? Because, like, what works early on may not work later on. Like, eventually you have to settle into who you are as an offense, and that's where Nick Saban thrives. And so – uh, if they can survive the first couple of series, Alabama is going to feel good. Conversely, if you're Texas, you need to take advantage of those first couple of series until Alabama's defense settles in and is able to make adjustments. Uh, you need to go out there and score and capitalize on those opportunities. Texas had a couple chances of doing that before the Quinn injury, a couple drop passes. Uh, and then obviously the shoulder injury ruined that. But if they can jump out to a 14 nothing, 14 3 type lead, all of a sudden Alabama's playing comeback football. And as we'll talk about in a second, that offense isn't built to do that. It's not. It's not. And that'll be a key. Yeah, you're right about that. That first quarter, quarter and a half, the 20, 25 play script, um, you know, Sark is really good at it. And, they, you know, Sark has been praised coast to coast for his ability to script those plays and design the formations and, you know, put teams on their heels. What he gets criticized for, and I think rightfully, is then the adjustments beyond that. And that's yeah. to your point of can Saban and his defense weather the script and then get it into the, into their hands. And then can Sark adjust r- around that with a quarterback on the road in that hostile environment? I think it's well said. I'll also say while we're, while we're talking here on the Eyes on Texas multicast and previewing Texas and Alabama, Texas offense against Alabama defense, two key entries to keep an eye on for that Alabama defense. And Nick Saban said this week, uh, two of his members of his really good secondary are day by day. They're not sure. Malachi Moore is a senior who plays the star position. Uh, they also have a free safety named uh, Jalen Key, who's also a senior graduate transfer. Uh, he's a guy that's played a lot of football at the D1 level. Those two guys got banged up in the uh, the game against Middle Tennessee. And, and Saban, I don't know what you want to say, he wasn't optimistic, but he was pretty candid and said, these aren't long-term injuries for either guy, but they were, they're going to be day-to-day. And it's going to be how they heal and probably how they can handle pain on game day because they're not going to be 100%. That's something with your matchup point about the Texas wide receivers against the Bama secondary. Maybe that comes into play. Maybe you get a young guy which, again, he's going to be talented because he's out of Alabama, but you're going to get a freshman like Tony Mitchell uh, on the field or a trust freshman like Trey Amos playing uh, you know, or a free free safety position. Earl Little is a redshirt freshman who would play that star position for Malachi Moore. So those are things to watch. Uh, do you think, Mike, uh, that Texas is able to uh, establish a ground game at all? They weren't last year even with Bijan and Roshan, a traditional running game. Are you optimistic they'll be able to, to run the fo- football? I mean, I don't think I'm not optimistic that they're going to dominate this game by running the football. But I think if they're steady with it and consistent with it and don't abandon it when it doesn't work early, that they're able to get there in third and fourth quarters. Like, I I think if this game stays close, even if Texas can build a lead, I think this offensive line is good enough to start leaning on folks. But that Alabama defensive front is huge. Uh, they're, they're, they are really good players, obviously. You know, Nick Saban's always good at stopping the run. Um, so it's going to be tough sledding early on. I don't expect Texas to come out and start getting four or five yards a pop. My worry is Texas then abandons the run because it doesn't work early on. I think if you're UT, you have to stay with it, stay consistent, keep using it, not only to keep – just like the deep shots, right? It doesn't always have to work. You're just trying to put that in somebody's mind. That way that RPO and the quick passing game over the middle and stuff opens up. That doesn't work as well if you're not able to run the football. Agreed, agreed. And a couple notes on that. Uh, great news on C.J. Baxter. We told you on Monday and in the, uh, the earlier episode – this week that uh, CJ Baxter was back at practice. He should be a full go with the uh, left that second left in the second quarter of the rice game. He'll be good to go. Cole Hudson, who didn't play the starting right guard. He was back at practice this week. And uh, DJ Campbell, who was his replacement, the redshirt freshman from our, our, from Arlington, he got rolled up a little bit on in that rice game and he's not a hundred percent. So whoever's playing right guard may not be at a hundred percent, kind of like the, the secondary guys for Alabama. Uh, but keep an eye on that. Uh, we'll see how the rotation goes. Kyle Flood has to get more out of his offensive line this week. Sark was not happy. We played those cuts earlier in the week about 
we're 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 more physical than that. And and I know a lot of Texas fans were concerned and rightfully that they couldn't push Rice, they couldn't win the line of scrimmage dominantly against Rice. That's a problem against this Alabama team, obviously. So I agree with you. Whether it's C.J. Baxter or or uh, Jonathan Brooks or Jaden Blue, I don't think you're going to win with the traditional running game. But for those quick passes and those screen plays like we saw to Jonathan Brooks last week, those can become extensions of your run game, and that can loosen up a defense. I'll be really interested to see the formations, and I know. Uh, my, my co-host on the morning show here on the horn is Rod Babers. You know him well, the football theorist. He believes the way to attack this 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 defense is is, is an empty formation. Yeah. Uh, get get uh, Quinn yours uh, by himself, and even if you have to motion into that, uh, where you're forcing Alabama into some some obvious coverages by by being in in traditional like eleven personnel with a running back, and then J T Sanders eleven personnel right with say it's Jonathan Brooks or. C.J. Baxter, and then you have J.T. Sanders and three receivers. Uh, out of that, you, you can motion and go five wide. And you could, and as and as Rod has said, send J.T. Sanders and the running back to the out, the outside, the furthest outside, and bring your receivers inside. And now you're creating mismatches with your talented receivers, X X Man, uh, Jordan Whittington, uh, A.D. Nayer, and they're matched up on linebackers and safeties now. Uh, or you get the corner Kool Aid McKinstry, as you said, who is now following an Xavier Worthy to the inside, which can create a, a, a mismatch on the outside. Empty set. Uh, Quinn is very comfortable and empty. Uh, the other part of that, Mike, that you can do from the offensive side when you go empty is go tempo. Because if you get a first down or hit a play, well, now you can come back with the same personnel, get back and run the football, uh, and, and, and try to go tempo and d- disguise what you're doing. I, I think that is something. I know you kind of think on the road you want to be a little little careful, kind of, kind of you know, slow it down a little bit. Now, keep, you know, but I think it's the opposite. I think you got to go here. I think you got to stretch them out, use your skill, trust your offensive line to protect your quarterback, get the ball out of his hands. And, and, and sh- you know, when, when you have five wides, Mike, you don't have to make as many reads, right? You, you know where your mismatch is. They can't double cover everybody. There's going to be a one-on-one mismatch that you can exploit. Yeah, I mean, you can't go in here with a conservative game plan. I, I don't think Sark will. You can't get into a body blow contest out of Alabama. They're going to win that game. You have to do what you do well. And you can tell Babers is really close with Kyle Shanahan, right? Like the positionless football. Um, I think Sark wants to do that. That's why you get a JT Sanders. That's why you have guys out of the backfield who can run and go uh, be a wide receiver and a Jonathan Brooks and a Keelan Robinson. We'll see what C.J. Baxter's ability uh, out of the backfield is. Uh, but I agree completely. Uh, get them on the edge. Use that personnel. Um, to disguise what you're going to do with the same exact personnel. You can be in 12, you can be in 21, you can be five wide. Like that's the advantage Texas has with the amount of skills guys that they've put on this roster uh, that can do a bunch of different different things. Maybe Savion Red, somebody like that can make a little bit of an impact and a wrinkle. Um, so they've been working on stuff for six to eight months for this game, right? We talked about this on the, on the Monday show. Um, Texas didn't prepare for Rice. They didn't do a bunch of stuff specifically for that Rice defense. They're going to do a bunch of stuff specifically for this Alabama defense, and we're going to see what those wrinkles are that, that Sark and Milwee and Flood have been working on uh, for the last six to eight months. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, don't be conservative. Go after it. And that's what was exciting about last year's game. They were they were not conservative. They came out gunning and uh, getting after Alabama. I think you got to carry that right into to uh, Tuscaloosa. Uh, and I also know that, I mean, Texas is the more veteran team here, right? They're breaking in a new quarterback at Alabama. Jalen Milrow had a couple of starts last year. Uh, he's the uh, uh, the Texas quarterback from Katie Tompkins High School. And interesting that uh, Jalen Milrow was one time a Texas commitment. Uh, recruited by Steve Sarkeesian, Mike, when he was at Alabama. So he knows the player very well, knows his family very well. And then Jalen Milrow, you know, he, I think this is right, Mike, you were covering the recruiting meet at the time. Didn't he decommit when Quinn Ewers committed to Texas? Wasn't that how that played out? And then Quinn, of course, decommitted to go to Ohio State. Uh, but, and that's when Sark came back in on Jalen Milrow when Quinn Ewers committed. Like, yeah, I mean, to to you know, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting kind of like, cross section of stories here you know Quinn Ewers comes to Texas or transfers to Texas and that's what opens up uh, Milrow to go to Alabama Sark is the offense coordinator at Alabama at the time gets Milrow to commit then Sark comes to Texas and then gets to coach Quinn Ewers and so uh, he has a lot of familiar familiarity with both Uh, they have familiarity with him and there is kind of this I wonder you know probably more for Milrow than Quinn kind of this idea that this guy kind of bumped me out of my quote unquote dream school. Right. And so uh, there's going to be plenty of motivation for Milrow to show that he was better than Quinn Ewers all along, you know, whether he is or not, we'll find that out uh, maybe more on Saturday. Uh, but he's a, he's a competitive dude. I mean, he, that he made Katie Tompkins good for the first time in Katie Tompkins history and they hadn't been good since he left. Right. So the dude's a winner. 
He's a gamer. Doesn't do a bunch of stuff in practice that maybe blows you away. Wasn't a great camp guy back on, on the recruiting scene, which kind of hurt his his recruiting rankings. Uh, but when tech, when when somebody like Sark thinks he can come run a major offense at Alabama, he's a good, pretty good football player. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how those storylines play out as well. Uh, this is the Eyes on Texas Multicast Preview Edition. Uh, we appreciate you watching. We are brought to you by our presenting partner at Grande Equipment, locally owned and independent, but worldwide equipment company leader that has been serving the heavy equipment needs and in industry since 2004. Find Wes and the team online at grandeequipment.com. Also thank our uh, presenting and founding partners, Carlos Carrion, the TexasMortgageGuy.com, Hayes City Store and Ice House in Driftwood, Texas, at Scratch Comfort Food, One Source Gas of Central Texas as well, online at onesourcegasatx.com. Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. Greg Eckert, I'm going to have a brand new smile by next week, Mike. I'm excited about that. Dr. Greg with a U, U-E-C-K-E-R-T. Also check out his Brain Vault technology. It's not a mouthpiece. It allows you to play hard, but play safe. Go to brainvault.com. All right, Mike, so that's a little bit of the Texas offense against the Bama defense. We are in agreement that the run game is going to be tough, but you got to stick with it. You also... Um, you know, need to be, be be attacking with your your passing game. That's a strength, and it's a strength on strength because Alabama's secondary is very good, and usually it's coached by Nick Saban, right? So they're going to be well coached and well schooled. But you know, you got to feel like that's our strength. You got to go for it. And uh, Jatavion Sanders as well. And this offensive line has to hold up in a high in a big way. Uh, what about the flip side? You talk about Jalen Milrow being a competitor. I find this interesting that uh, Pete Kwiatkowski went against Alabama when he was the defensive coordinator of Washington in 2016. And they had a quarterback named Jalen Hurts, who, same name, uh, very similar player. Uh, Jalen at the time out of Channel View, Texas, was uh, you know, 6'2", 220, runner better than a thrower. Um, obviously, Jalen has worked on his passing and has become a, an elite player at the NFL level. And maybe Jalen Milrow will too. But Pete Kwiatkowski had a game plan for that game in the national title game, how to stop a running quarterback. I, I believe the key to this game for Texas on defense is the, the legs of Jalen Milrow, Mike. Uh, I think they'll do a good job with that defensive front of stoning the, the the traditional running game from Alabama where Jace McClellan, another Texan, is their lead running back. They have Roydale Williams. They've got Jam Miller, another Texan, the sophomore. But I think Texas showed last week against Rice they're not going to get pushed around by anybody. Their defensive front is going to be in the backfield. So the, 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 the best way to get run game is going to be quarterback run, right? And maybe even like Texas, Mike, out of spread formation to spread the field and then create a situation where Texas has to either spy – uh, or come up with a plan for Jalen Milrow and his legs because he's a better runner than passer right now. This is going to be a real big game for the second level of that Texas defense. You know, I, I think the interior is going to kind of wash out Alabama. Alabama is going to be focused on on doubling those guys and, and eliminating Byron uh, Murphy and Tavondre Sweat and, and uh, Alfred Collins and those guys up front. They're going to attack the edges, and they're going to attack probably opposite linebacker of Jalen Ford. They're going to try to isolate those kind of guys and see what they're about. We think Ethan Burke's good. We think Bar Baron Sorrells is going to take a ne next step. David Benda played a good game against Rice. Like they're going to try to find. This is what Nick Saban tends to do, right? He tries to find the guys on defense that he wants to isolate, and he has his offensive coordinator attack them, attack them, attack them. If your Texas success in the first quarter doesn't mean you're going to have success in the third quarter, because Alabama, one of the things I love most about Alabama under Nick Saban is they do what they do and they keep doing it. Like even if you stop it for a few plays. They're going to make you stop it for 80. And Texas kind of did that for most of the game last year. And then Bryce Young just made a couple plays late, went and won the football game. Uh, I think that's going to be a, a similar game plan here. They're going to come out and do what they do well, which is run the football. They averaged over five yards a carry uh, last week. If you take away sack adjusted stuff, it's closer to six. Uh, but Milrow was their biggest runner. He led, led the team in running. Uh, he had, I think, two or three rushing touchdowns to go along with, with three uh, passing touchdowns. And so uh, you're right. Stopping Jalen Milrow, making him into a passer and making him one dimensional, making this offense in general one dimensional is going to be a big part of it, as well as the big plays, right? Like Texas allowed a really long run to McClellan last year in that in that game. Other than that, they played really good against the running game. And so being good against it 98% of the time isn't good enough. You got to be good, at, good against it 100% of the time. And we'll see if Texas is able to do that. For me, this is about the second level of the Texas defense and those linebackers. Jalen Ford kind of came out in this game last year. That was kind of the game he announced himself as a real deal linebacker next to DeMarvion Overshone. Maybe one of these defensive players does that in this game as well next to him. We well, love the way you put that. Demo not there, right? Demo's with the Cowboys, but injured. Uh, it's going to be David Benda. We saw him blow a coverage last week against Rice. Uh, Benda's going to be a guy, number 33, who you got to think Nick Saban's going to try to isolate one of those players you're talking about. Uh, Anthony Hill Jr. 
Uh, Jet Bush is going to be out there, and I agree with you. This is a tackling game. I mean, every game you have to block and tackle. That's obviously stated. But you have to tackle because if you spy Jalen Milrow, that guy's got to tackle him, right? Because, you know, you're spying for a reason to provide coverage behind it. Um, but if he, if he takes off, you can't miss the tackle. And, and one thing I do like the idea of is multiple spies, not one spy. Don't let them identify who your spy is going to be because that's, you know, Nick Saban's too smart for that. They'll design plays to beat it, beat the spy beaters, they call them. Uh, but, man, I, we've even had the discussion, you know, you, you know, could Ethan Burke stand up and be a spy? I think he's athletic enough, uh, the former lacrosse player from Westlake. Uh, he's a, not, not exclusively, I don't think anybody, but you could have a handful, five or six guys that you trust to spy and can run with Jalen Milrow, but you got to get him to the ground when you do. Uh, because what we did see last year, and we haven't, he hasn't been forced to do it this year yet, is when he has to throw, when he becomes a pocket passer, if you can contain him in the pocket and make him throw, he'll throw you some. He went through five touchdowns last year, three interceptions. He was only 57% completion. Uh, so Texas, who is a ball hawking secondary, uh, should be able to uh, force it, but you got to force him to throw, right? You got to you got to make him that guy. And Sark said on Monday, even against Rice when they were dominant defensively, there were some times when he was unhappy with their their pass lane discipline on the defensive line because he's already thinking ahead to next week. Guys, we can't get out of our integrity. We can't get out of our gap because Milrow's going to shred us for that, especially if we're in the wrong coverage behind it. Uh, we've got to be really disciplined. And you said it, 98% of the time, not good enough. This is a game, if you're going to win it, back to the five or six losses in, in 15 years on that field, you, you got to do it 100% of the time. I mean, 100% of the time. Uh, you're human. You're going to make some mistakes. But, boy, we'll go back to last year. If Ryan Watts brings down Bryce Young on a corner blitz and gets him to the ground, Texas probably wins that game, even, even with the bad calls and the officials and everything else. If Ryan Watts coming on a, a perfectly called corner blitz by PK uh, gets Bryce Young to the ground, the, the clock probably becomes impossible for, for Alabama to win that football game. And that's the kind of stuff you're talking about. Because it's going to be that kind of game again. Yeah, I mean, to me, the first half is just what the first half is going to be, right? One of these teams is going to be up by seven or so, uh, and it's going to be who plays the better second half. And historically, for I mean, it's only been two seasons in one game, but that's been the bugaboo for Texas under Sark. You know, they're 16, seven and two in the first half, uh, but only 13 and 12 overall. Well, now 14 and 12 overall. And so um, they're going to have to play well in the second half. And then what happens if they're behind? You know, the only two comeback wins, you know, from halftime in Sark's tenure are one point and two points. They've never come from behind in a big set, a big first half lead. If Alabama uses that home field, gets out to a hot, hot start like Alabama does, are they able to track them down? And conversely, if Texas gets off to a hot, hot start, are they able to keep that pace and stay on top of them? Uh, to me, this game's going to all come down to halftime adjustments and who comes out and plays better in the second half. I'd imagine that's what Texas' players have been told all offseason. And so it's time to kind of see – if uh, the coaching staff has matured, if the players have matured, if there's more depth there that allows them to keep compete in one of these games in the second half, because that's really been the thing that's kept Texas from being elite these last year or two is just their, their ability to close out a football game and to play a second half. Uh, this one's going to test that uh, quickly. No doubt. I think that's very well said because uh, all Texas fans know that whatever this game is headed into the fourth quarter, you know, don't be don't be too overconfident because Texas was a great three quarter team last year. No, year one, I don't say I throw it away, but you know, they were terrible in the second half in those games too. Uh, but they had there, I think there were, you know, depth issues that they had that year. Uh, they couldn't really go too deep, so they'd run out of gas in the fourth quarter a lot of times. I thought last year, those four losses in the regular season were mental mistakes, right? It was, it was just not getting it done. A couple of plays here and there against Oklahoma State, Texas Tech. Uh, you know, even the TCU game was there uh, most of the second half to go win. Uh, the, those are games you you have to you have to win. Uh, but this is a different animal than Texas Tech even. And that's, you know, the road record for Sark's not great. Heck, the overall record is just average. And that's why a Herculean task here if Texas wins it. I know we talked on the pregame or the, per, the pregame, the, the, our, our, our Monday episode, that uh, you're, you were of the opinion that, that you, you like the points here, that Texas is getting seven, seven and a half. Uh, they played a one-point game with this team last year. I think Texas is a little better this year than they were a year ago. Or maybe a lot better. We'll see. And Alabama may not be as good. And and you can say what you want about Alabama fans who will argue that. You lost the first and third picks of the NFL draft. Bingo. Uh, and a Heisman Trophy winner and one of your best defensive players in program history. You can't sit here and tell me you're better than you were. You may be more talented in some other areas, but those two dudes were difference makers. You don't have those two guys this year. Doesn't mean you don't have good players. But so so I think Texas is a little better, a little deeper. 
uh, a more year more experienced in the coaching continuity. Uh, and then Alabama, new coordinators on both sides of the ball. Don't have Bryce Young. Don't have Will Anderson. That's why I think this game, if, if you're a gambling person, might want to take the points. Sure, it could get ugly. Texas could get steamrolled and get uh, just get caught up in that. I don't think that happens. I think this game's a lot more like last year's game than than people a lot of people think. I'll put it this way. If the Texas roster was playing for Alabama and the Alabama roster was playing for Texas, we wouldn't be discussing who was the favorite. You know, like uh, the the reason Alabama's favorite here is we trust Nick Saban and they're playing at home. You know, they're pretty even. If not, Texas has the slight edge in terms of not overall roster talent, but like the best upperclassmen, the most experienced, and the guys that are proven. Like Alabama doesn't have a JT Sanders. They don't have an Xavier Worthy. They don't even have a Tavondre Sweat, really, that, that's proven on that side of the ball defensive line-wise. And so uh, I think Texas has a lot of advantages here. It's going to come down to the sidelines for me. We talked about it. Our, our show all off season. Like I, I have no questions about Texas's talent and raw ability to go win every single football game on the roster or on their schedule, including this one. Uh, it's going to come down to the coaching staff for me. Uh, to me, the biggest battle of this game is Nick Saban versus Steve Sarkeesian. And we've seen Nick Saban do it for decades now. Uh, this is a real major test for Steve Sarkeesian to finally get out over that hump and prove himself as a head coach in one of these crucial games. Yeah. Uh, to your point on that, I mean, uh, I think that's a great point that if we sw- flip rosters, what would the discussion be? That's one of those, uh, um, you know, thought experiments. Uh, but, you know, again, you're right, because the best receiver for Alabama is Jermaine Burton. We saw him last year. But honestly, in this game in Austin last year, the receivers had bad games. They dropped a lot of balls, uh, ran bad routes for, for Bryce Young. They don't win that game with Bryce Young not being Superman in the fourth quarter. And Jameer Gibbs, who was incredible, who's now playing for the Detroit Lions. Uh, but Jermaine Burton, pretty good receiver who they expected more from. Isaiah Bond is a sophomore that's good in the slot. Their tight end's name is C.J. Dupree. Uh, he's a guy, but he's not Detavion Sanders. We talked about Jalen Milrow. Uh, but they like their offensive line a lot, and they start a true freshman at left tackle. I think Kelvin Banks a year ago, a kid named Caden Proctor, is a true freshman. He's a mountain of a freshman, but he is manning the left tackle spot. Uh, they, they've got uh, a senior at center in Seth McLaughlin. Uh, J.C. Latham is, a, is a, a junior at right tackle. He's a, an experienced player. Their offensive line is going to be good. You know that. They average 340 pounds. Mike. Yeah, they're big boys. Uh, these are big dudes. That, 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 there'll be a lot of NFL scouts at this game, specifically watching the matchup of the Longhorn front on defense and that Alabama front because there'll be a lot, of, a lot of Sunday players going head-to-head. Uh, and some of that outside. How about, how about the matchup of X Worthy with uh, a guy like Kool-Aid McKinstry? Those are the kind of matchups you want to see. But I think to your, your overall point, you're right. I think you take the Texas uh, skill players. I think you'd probably take the Texas quarterback at this point, even though there's a lot of fans that aren't uh, real big on Quinn Ewers right this second. Uh, and they even defensively, I think Texas right now has the more proven stars uh, when you're talking Jalen Ford. And, you know, one, somebody we didn't see much last week against Rice, Jalen Catalan. Hmm. You know, what if a former SEC player at Arkansas, what if Jalen Catalan uh, gets in this game, starts making some plays? John A. Barron is a playmaker. Uh, so, and that Texas defense was so good last, last week. You got to feel good because you can win games – Low scoring on the road with great defense and don't turn the ball over. That's one thing for the Quinn detractors. He didn't turn the ball over last week. Uh, no turnover, so only only five penalties. That's the kind of game you have to play in this one and not get caught up in the moment, but play your assignment. The, uh, the old Nick Saban, uh, Bill Belichick motto, do your job, do your job, but do it every time, Mike, not 88 out of, or 98 out of 100 times. Yeah, I mean, this is about the the maturity and evolution of, of this roster. They've always been able to do it well eight out of ten times. It's those other two times that, that come back to haunt them. They make a couple of mistakes, and all of a sudden they've let a team back into the game that maybe they shouldn't. Uh, that was true last year, right? Like Texas could have won that game by ten. Had that offense played better, they avoid some injuries, some some mistakes. Like They were the better football team on that day uh, last year in DKR. Now – I do think some of that's going to play against them. Like, you know, Nick Saban's going to have this team ready to play in a way that I don't think they took Texas as seriously last year. Um, They came in there. I I don't even think Texas fans thought that they had as much of a chance as as they did once that game got going. Um, Alabama's going to be plenty of motive, plenty motivated. Texas is going to have to weather that early, early little storm. Uh, But then guys like Jalen Catalan, I think that he could be the guy who ends up being one of the major spies uh, for Jalen Milrow or or a big part of of tackling in space and keeping those three or four scramble, three or four yard scrambles from becoming 15, 20, 80 yard scrambles, right? Like it's going to be tackling in space. And so Texas has a roster to go win this football game. Uh, They've gone through the fire the last couple of years to have the motivation to go win this football game. A lot of these guys on this roster were a snap or two away from beating this Alabama team. So the belief should be there. You just got to go do it. Got to go do it. And I, you know, we were talking earlier about, uh, 
PK in his uh, matchup back in the in 2016, right? With with uh, it was an Alabama team coached by Nick Saban, and it was at a quarterback named Jalen uh, Hurts, who's similar to Milrow. We already said that. There's a great quote uh, that our friends at Inside Texas pulled off from Buda Baker. Remember Buda Baker? He's, he was a great but part of that really good Washington secondary. And uh, no, he he previewed because of course everybody does interviews ahead of national semifinal games. And Buda Baker said, "Look, we we trust the quarterback, but we believe if we can make him make him throw." And make him a passer. We give ourselves our best chance. And when he, if he does run, which he's going to do, we got to hit him, and we got to hit him again, and hit him again. And that was Buda Baker. And you know, PK is saying the exact same thing. Jeff Choate, uh, the entire defensive staff. He's going to get some yards. He's a good player, but those those hits take their toll over time, uh, Mike. Uh, if you hit him in the first quarter, hit him in the second quarter, keep hitting him. I'm not saying illegally, and don't get 15 yard penalties, but do it with discipline got to hit that quarterback when he puts himself out there. I know he's 220 pounds, but, you know, Longhorn guys have guys bigger than that. you got to hit him. I'm looking at that Buda Baker quote right now thinking that's the game plan because you get in that fourth quarter, if you've hit Jalen Milrow enough and given him some punishment, uh, maybe he's the one that's not in his best at the fourth quarter. That would be your goal. Obviously, Quinn, yours, I would say, on the other side, took too many hits last week against Rice. Uh, Rice should not have been hitting your quarterback that many times. If, if we're seeing that on Saturday, Quinn may not finish the game and Texas won't win the game. Yeah, I mean, this thing may come down to which offensive line performs better. You know, sure. it, it may just be a, a, as simple as that. I think the lack of performance or lack of dominant performance against Rice, especially in the first half, can only help Kyle Flood motivate this group. You know, like they didn't just beat a team 70 to three and they didn't have anything to yell at them about. And they're still reading press clippings. They got humbled a little bit. You know, like they were supposed to be one of the best offensive lines in the nation. 20 starts a piece on average across the board, return five starters, seven or eight guys that can really play high level football. And they got pushed around a little bit. They got it kind of got humbled and not embarrassed, but they definitely did not play a game uh, that's going to lead to a, a fun film session on Sunday. Right. And so they've been hearing it all week. They know the, the step in competition is going to be there. I'd imagine we see a, a better offensive line performance than we did last week. Agreed. I mean, and uh, you know, we played a lot of the clips in our Monday broadcast from Sark, but you know, we, we talked a little bit, but Sark was Sark was uh, testy with the media on Monday, more than we've seen. And I, I we, Rod Babers and I were talking about that, and he said, you know what? He watched the film. He watched the film because it's one thing to watch from the sidelines and kind of see that, you know, but when you go back and watch that film, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy with what he saw. Uh, there, were, You know, it's one of those, a lot of talk this offseason about what we're going to be. You weren't that in that first half. Third quarter was better, so that's where he spun it positive. That at least we reacted to it, made some adjustments, and played better and took the game over. But you know he was not happy, uh, yeah, and you know those guys heard it. Because uh, look, this is this is the question for Texas, you know, put up or shut up, uh, quit, qu quit. It's the it's not just the media that's overrating Texas if they're overrated this year. It's the, the players. They talk about a team that can go win the Big Twelve. They talk about a team that can compete down by down with Alabama. Well, you didn't do that against Rice. You should have been better. Uh, that should have been a more one sided game. But I'm pretty sure that's what Sark and Kyle Flood and those guys told him. Hey, your defense was playing to a championship level. You guys were not, uh, and that. You know that's motivation. You're you're probably right about that. I I think for me, with in, in the in the world of rat poison and motivation, you're dead right about Nick Saban using last year's game to make sure it doesn't happen again on his side. Uh, but you know them beating Middle Tennessee State fifty six to three or whatever the score was. Uh, Texas scuffled a little bit with Rice. I'd rather be in the Texas side of that because you're right. There's some really good players that got an earful uh, this week, and uh, we'll see if that shows up. Uh, motivation's a big key, and as you said last week, last year or last, earlier in the show, but last year, Texas was the better team on that day. And that's how these games go. You have to be the better team on that day. Uh, and can Texas do that? That's uh, that's critical. One other note for me with, with this Texas offense, Mike, uh, and this this Texas team, uh, you, you have to, in a game like this, break tendency. You have to break tendency. You can't uh, – and I, I trust Sark will, and I trust that uh, Nick Saban will. You know, the, you know, you get into the grind of a regular season. That's harder to do. You have shorter times to prepare. But, man, you've had all offseason to prepare for this game. Uh, whatever, you, as you said, the Rice game was not something you game planned for. They didn't, they didn't game plan for Middle Tennessee. They've been game planning for each other for six months now. But in that, what is it that they know you do, and how do you use that against them, right? What is, what is your tendency? How do you break the tendency? That's going to be the key for me. You're right about the offensive line. The blocking and tackling is always critical. But who breaks tendency? Who uses something that the other side thinks they're going to do and then does the old reverse Johnny and uh, does something different? I've said this a few times, but I, I do believe that throwback screen to Jonathan Brooks that we've now seen in back-to-back -back games, Texas threw it against Washington in the Alamo Dome and went, Alamo Dome and went for, that, for a touchdown. 
threw it last week. It's one of the, the more exotic plays they ran in that game. Look for that play with all the same flow and formation and, and alignment and play and look for a pump fake and something else, right? Because you know, point of emphasis for Sar- for Nick Saban this week is when we see this formation, when we see 24 and we see the flow of this play, look screen pass. Don't get caught over here on the wrong hash mark. Well, can you take advantage of that knowing Nick Saban is going to make that a point of emphasis this week in training and practice and use that and build a play off of it that creates a different big play? That's the kind of stuff I mean with break tendency. Yeah, we're going to see a double pass off of that either this week or against Oklahoma and, and some big in big game. Honestly, this is going to sound reductive, but I think the t- if it's going to come down to can Texas run the ball better than Jalen Milrow can pass it? Whoever can whoever can do that second thing, right? Like Texas's bread and butter is going to be passing the football. Alabama's bread and butter is going to be running the football either by quarterback or running back. Who can do the other thing better? And who can stay more balanced? And who can put the defense in a bind? Uh, if Texas can run the ball with success or if Alabama has a lot of success passing when they want to, it's going to be a long night for one of those defenses. And so uh, who can be who can do their curveball better? Who can throw their second pitch better? I think wins this football game. Don't disagree at all. Uh, we'll do some score predictions here coming up and a couple of keys to the game. I think, Mike, you just gave your keys to the game right there. Uh, that was outstanding. I've given mine throughout the uh, the broadcast. Uh, here on the Eyes on Texas Multicast. We are powered by Grande Equipment. Thanks to all of our, our title uh, our presenting partners as well. Carlos Carrion, the Texas Mortgage Guy.com, Hayes City Store, an ice house in Driftwood, Texas, one source gas of Central Texas. Also, Greg Eckert, Dr. Greg Eckert. I'll have that brand new smile by next week. I'm excited about it. His Brain Vault technology as well. If you're playing football or playing contact sports of any kind, you got to check out BrainVault.com. It's a mouthpiece, but it's more than that. It allows you to play hard, but play safe and avoid concussions. Uh, really is great. And, of course, Grande Equipment, who uh, are our presenting partner. Uh, some quick special teams notes, Mike, because it's the third phase. And I know when I we, to beat a Nick Saban team, as I mentioned, you need elite quarterback play or elite defense. But you also have to play all three phases at an elite level because, you know, you might do very well on everything else, but you'll give up a kick return. You give up a punt return. You get a punt blocked. Uh, you don't execute the kicking game. That's another way to lose this game when you're, you know, a team that, that has every opportunity to win it. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, they're going to have to play a clean football game. You, you can't you can't allow a big play on a return for Alabama to get into to field position. You got to make all your field goals. Like every point is going to matter in this football game. Every blade of grass is going to matter in this football game. Uh, the team that wins the turnover battle, the team that makes fewer mistakes in all three phases of the game, and the team who tackles better, and that also is in the return game, uh, is going to win this football game. Uh, if one of these teams can can come up with a special teams touchdown or a defensive touchdown or misses a couple field, like that's going to be the difference in the game. This one should be pretty tight. All right, do you have a uh, final score prediction, Mike, on our multicast? Our first of the year, first ever, because we do this is our first year of doing the Eyes on Texas multicast. Uh, do you have a prediction? Yeah, I got Texas to cover. I'm going to take uh, Alabama 28, Texas 24. I just until they can prove that they can close out a big game in the fourth quarter, uh, I'm going to lean on the side of, of the home team that has Nick Saban on the sideline. I'm with you. I wrote mine down, and uh, we're we're very similar. I do think this is a game played in the 20s. Unless some turnovers happen, uh, then it maybe gets into the 30s. But much like last year's 20 to 19 game, I think it's uh, it's Bama 27, Texas 23. Uh, those who are very similar in our scores. Uh, I, I think Texas can win the game. I'll say that. I think Texas, mm-hmm. and we've said it, I think, throughout the, the 45 minutes we've been doing this. I think they can win the game. Uh, but it's one of those things, until you see it, can you pick it? Uh, it's right there. I you know They were a 21-point underdog last year and dang near won the game. They're a seven-point underdog this year. Um, but and the mindset and the the uh, the the language of this team all offseason has been pointing to a game like this that we're different. We, we we're going to execute in the fourth quarter. We're going to be the more dominant team in the fourth quarter. Uh, they know it. They've identified it. Can you fix it? And here we go. Uh, Mike, great stuff. A uh, couple of other thoughts. Do you have any other uh, as you're going to be covering? You're going out to uh, Lubbock for the big uh, Texas Tech Oregon game. That should be fun. That's a it's an afternoon game or is that a night game? On it's Saturday? a night game. Kicks off at six uh, in Jones. It's a it's a fun atmosphere. I mean, I, Texas fans probably have a bad memory of that Crabtree catch at night, but there are always weird things that happen in Jones. Uh, Texas Tech under Joey McGuire has been a lot better at home than they've been on the road. Hard to be worse than they have been on the road. They're one in five on the road in his tenure. And so, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. It'll be my second stop on my 13 stop tour uh, of the college football season and uh, still going strong. Uh, you were at TCU last week for, you know, what a thriller that was with Colorado. Hey, let me ask you a couple. You're a gambler. Do you like, uh, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit Matt Rule and three and a half points now. I don't know why. I just feel like yeah. this is the week where you said it on Monday, so credit you, but I believe it too, that gamblers can do the best if they're paying attention 
to the overreactions, right? The lines that jumped. Even this Texas game, uh, most of the offseason was inside a touchdown. Now it's over a touchdown based on week one performance. Uh, gosh, the Utah-Baylor game, Baylor's now getting, you know, eight or eight and a half points now because and their quarterback's hurt. Uh, those are the kind of games, I mean, heck, even, you know, Texas State, who last week pulled the big upset at Baylor, there it's inside two touchdowns at San Antonio against your alma mater, US, UTSA. I mean, these are, you know, and everybody's going to jump on Oregon because they scored 80 last week and Wyoming beat Texas Tech. Uh, this is that bounce back game that uh, sometimes it's it's where the the, the gambler the, the winnings can be found. It's really funny because like for six months we come up with these well informed full opinions of what these teams are going to be, and then one random game on the first week of the Saturday completely throws it out the window, and then the lines start moving. And you can take advantage of that. I mean, week two is a big week for gamblers because you can react to the overreaction. That UTSA Texas State one's a perfect one. Texas State goes into Waco. Beats the brakes off of Baylor. Momentum is on an all-time high. G.J. Kenny's the star of you know media this week. A lot of stories being written about him. UTSA didn't look too good. Frank Harris throws three interceptions in a loss against Houston. And all of a sudden, a line that probably would have been around 21 and a half 10 days ago is at 13. Well, go and hammer the Roadrunners. You know, they haven't lost two straight since 2020. They've only done it one time in the Jeff Trailer era, and that was his first year there. So uh, same with uh, – I would stay away from the Baylor line just because I have no idea what Sawyer Robinson is as a, as a quarterback. We haven't seen him yet. Uh, but Tech's another one. You know, Oregon's not as good as putting 80 up on Portland State. Like, Texas Tech is better than that. They're going to be playing at home. They've been better at home. They just lost a game on the road. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people see week one results and then – uh, completely changed their mind of what they had thought the six months previous. I would say be patient, stick with what you thought, and uh, take advantage of some of those lines that that may be a whole touchdown different than they would have been a week ago. And look, uh, much like in high school football, these three games, these non-conference games are to, are to get ready for conference. If Texas does lose Saturday, it doesn't end their season, right? They want to look competitive doing it. If they do lose, and obviously they win, it would be a different conversation on Monday when we record our next episode. But it doesn't end your season. You still have conference play to come. And it's a long year, uh, usually by October after four games are played. You kind of know what a team is at this point. As you said, we, we 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 make our predictions and speculate and then we throw it all out based on one performance. Uh, that's the overreaction. But that's what fans do. I like your picks right there. Uh, also, credit to you. If you go to Dave Campbell's and the website, it's TexasFootball.com. Your story on uh, G.J. Kinney that dropped this week I thought was outstanding. Uh, of course, his father. Uh, was was shot by a disgruntled parent when he was coaching Canton High School way back in, what, 2006. G.J. was a student at the time and a quarterback. Um, he ended up, once his, his father survived, thank goodness, and left high school football and went back to his alma mater at Baylor to be a position coach, right? Coach linebackers at Baylor. That's when G.J. transferred to Gilmer to play for a coach named Jeff Trailer, who's now at UTSA, who he's going to play coach against this week. Uh, there's that's a really cool coaching tie, and GJ's already beaten his dad's alma mater uh, mm -hmm. one week to start his career, and now has a chance to face his mentor and one of the closest people he has in the football world. Uh, that's really cool. That's a cool story to watch on Saturday. And he's beat Jeff Trailer as an underdog before. I mean, that year that his dad got shot, his dad came back and coached for Canton. They met Gilmer in the first round of the playoffs and upset him like 66 to 63 or something insane like that, where Kenny threw for seven or eight touchdowns, had one of the best games of his life. Uh, and so it was just funny to transfer to the school that you had just beat, right? I mean, you get to Gilmer and you just beat those guys in the playoffs. And so he's played against Trailer. He's played for Trailer. They're as thick as, as two coaches at the FBS level can get been close for you know almost 20 years now and so uh just a great story and one of those stories that makes college football unique and fun it's a regional rivalry i know it's not as big as texas oklahoma or a&m miami but to those fan bases it's probably bigger than those games and so uh, a lot of cool stuff in the state a lot of cool stuff in college football i just worry that we're getting to a point where we only care about 20 teams and there's like in college football there's 131 stories out there and 131 fan bases that really care about the product. And so uh, there's absolutely more out there to go find as a college football fan if you want it. And if you don't like how these suits are taking advantage of it and kind of squashing the game in that way, well, fight back by going and actually like watching the football game because those guys care about ratings and they, they'll they see that stuff and, and adjust if, if, us, if, us, if us fans uh, do the same. Yeah, watch the big games. I love that game in San Antonio. Uh, obviously, Texas and uh, Alabama is huge. Texas A&M Miami, any any thought? I know you do a podcast for A&M. They're feeling good about their road trip down to South Florida. That one can be a trap. Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, A and M's a minus uh, four and a half point uh, favorite. I think they're going to clear that. I think A and M's going to be really good this year. I mean, I, I don't know if they're going to win the SEC West, but I, I think they're going to be right there with Bama and LSU. That offense super loaded, similar to to Texas, where there's just not many holes on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, defense is the real concern for the Aggies. Their defensive coordinator DJ Durkin hadn't had a top eighty rush defense in five years. And his last five years as a defensive coordinator, dating back a couple of stops. And so they're going to have to get better against that. Uh, but playing at Miami is never all that hard. There may be as many Aggie fans uh, there as there are Hurricane fans. So I think A&M rolls this week. I don't know. Maybe that's the the kiss of death. But I think A&M has, has really turned the corner. Yeah. Last thing, we'll wrap it up. Uh, we have both picked Alabama to win by four points and cover the number. But uh, uh, we love your picks as well. Uh, let me say this, that uh, their one other cool story is Baylor playing Texas Tech, right? You were correct. Walk me through this one. Uh, excuse me, Texas Tech playing Oregon. Texas Tech, Oregon's offensive coordinator was a former assistant coach at Lake Travis, right? Who yeah, was Will Stein. UCSA, Will Stein, and Will Stein is now at at Oregon coaching offense, and he's the main reason that the Dripping Springs hot shot quarterback Austin Novosad uh, decommitted from Baylor and took off up to uh, to Oregon to play for the Ducks. He's coming back. He's he's a backup quarterback to Bo Nix now. But it's interesting to me that they, they, the, the, Will, the Will Stein conversation is a good one. And the fact that if Austin Novosad were still in, stayed with Baylor, he might be playing this week, <laughs> week against Utah, right? Uh, because I think he's probably better than the, the kid that transferred in behind uh, Blake Shapin, who got hurt in that Texas State loss. And he's going to miss this game. He may miss the Texas game, too, by the way, in a few weeks. That's the Longhorns opener in Big 12 play. But uh, Austin Novosad might be playing. There's a lot of cool storylines to follow this weekend, to your point of, that's not just about Texas and Alabama and the, the top 20 teams. Yeah, I mean, the Oregon versus Tech game features two of the best offensive coordinators under the age of 35. I mean, Will Stein, Zach Kittley are, are, are superstars that are going to be calling plays um, at major programs for a long time, probably head coaches uh, sooner than later. And so uh, that'll be a fun one to sneak in as well. To, if you have a second screen going uh, while you're watching Alabama, uh, Oregon, maybe move over to that Tech, uh, Oregon game, and, and you can you can really watch that one. Yeah, they're at the same time. Texas, Alabama, Oregon Tech is at six o'clock. So, yeah, two screens for sure. Hey, uh, appreciate it. Uh, I will let our audience know uh, watching this. If you want to come out and watch a watch party for the Texas, Alabama game with all of your uh, Texas friends, we're going to be out at the field house at the crossing, which is in Cedar Park. It is a massive outdoor and indoor facility. Bring your kids, bring your lawn chairs huge theater screen on the outside plus TVs everywhere. You won't miss a play. Great seating, great uh, drink specials as well. Uh, we'll be out there with the horn uh, with a pregame show starting at three o'clock and then we'll uh, watch the game at six. So if you're local or in Cedar Park, Williamson County, come on out. It's Fieldhouse at the crossover right there. It's uh, uh, right where the uh, HEB Center at Cedar Park is. It's right across the 183 tollway, essentially back to, back one block off. It, it's easy to find. Fieldhouse at the crossover. If you're uh, in Austin or in Central Texas, want to watch that game with a bunch of Longhorn fans and aren't going to not, uh, to Tuscaloosa. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, great work. Safe travels to Lubbock and back, my friend. Of course. Talk to you next week.